Well, good morning to everyone. Happy Sabbath. Here we are on the uh, tenth day of the seventh month, the Day of Atonement. Uh, on most calendars, even if you're looking on your iPhone, you can see a little uh, dot there, and when you click on it, you know, it's the day of Yom Kippur, and the day, as some refer to as the Great Fast. Christians and uh, Jews might choose to fast many days throughout the year, and many different ways, you know. Sometimes people fast just from a particular item. But today we're commanded to fast, as the scripture tells us, we're to afflict our souls. And, you know, I know that uh, it's, um, it's a day that we do afflict our souls and that comes around once a year. Some of you may choose to fast more than once a year, and that is absolutely fine and, and probably encouraged. But today is a day that we're commanded to fast. It's a, a day that's set apart on the uh, tenth day of the, the seventh month. And as I spoke a few weeks ago, the majority of God's holy days are in the seventh month, you know, beginning with uh, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Tabernacles, then the last great day, four of the seven are in this month. And so this is a busy month. And we'll start off by turning over to Leviticus 23, and um, hopefully some of the scriptures I read don't uh, mess up uh, what Neil has planned to speak about, um, and I'm sure it won't, but that's one of the reasons why I definitely like to go first, <laughs> because then I can say, well, he copied me, you know, but... Uh, but uh, Leviticus chapter 23, and, you know, as we know, all of God's holy days, and including his weekly Sabbath, is, are listed here. But more specifically with today, let's drop down to a verse 27. So in Leviticus chapter 23, drop down to verse 27, and read a few scriptures here. And it says, also on the tenth day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. That's today. It shall be a holy convocation to you. And you shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And you shall do no work in that same day, for it is the day of atonement in order to make an atonement for you, for you, for you and me, before your God. For whosoever is not afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. You know, you think about that. Everyone in this room, we live in different communities. But if we all happen to, you know, live in the same community as was taking place here, this was a day that if an individual, for whatever reason, chose, I'm not going to participate in the fast this year. You know, that, that soul, that individual, would have had some, some hard consequences to face by his or her community. And, wh and whoever does uh, any work in that same day, the same one will I destroy from among his people. And you shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. And in verse 32, it shall be to you a Sabbath of rest, and you shall afflict your souls. And one of the things that I think is interesting here is... As we know, God is, is more intelligent than we can even comprehend. And man is always looking for an angle, you know, always looking for a way to get around something, right? We call them loopholes. We call them this, what, whatever you want to call them. But on this particular holy day, we're commanded to afflict our souls. And, and to make sure that God is clear with his orders or his directions or instructions. He even goes as far to tell us how to do this. And it says, in the ninth day of the month, so that would have been yesterday, at sunset, from sunset to sunset, you shall keep your Sabbath. And you notice, it doesn't really say that 
about the Feast of Trumpets. Even though you and I know that night comes before day and the Sabbath begins of what we call Friday evening and ends on Saturday evening, on the Day of Atonement, God goes an extra mile to say, hey, just to make sure we're all clear here, when you're supposed to afflict your soul, when you're supposed to fast, he put that scripture in there. And you find that interesting because there are some individuals that say, you know, they're doing fast throughout the year. They might start their fast at midnight and go from midnight to 12 noon. or Some may go from when the sun sets to the next uh, day at noon. You know, there's all different ways that people fast. And I'm not trying to knock that. But specifically... On this day, we're commanded to do this from sunset to sunset on the 10th day of the seventh month. Now, last night as the Day of Atonement was beginning, you know, we, we ate our, our, our meal before the sun, sunset, you know, drank a lot of water yesterday and things like that, and I can already feel I've got a little bit of a headache coming on, okay? So um, I got a text from my son who's away at college, and it just said, Happy Atonement. <laughs> now, you know, I smiled because there's some hidden humor in that. But in all actuality, the last line we read in verse 32, you know, if you read that in verse 32, it says, uh, It shall be a statue forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings, and it shall be to you a Sabbath of rest, and you shall afflict your soul on the ninth day of the month from sunset to sunset, and you shall keep your Sabbaths. And in some translations it says, celebrate your Sabbath. I see you shaking your head, so yours says that. How do you celebrate the Day of Atonement, right? Because when we think of celebration, we think of, you know, maybe a potluck after services, Right? Or maybe if it was something different, maybe a big breakfast before church began, or maybe everyone goes and grabs some, a meal together. And that's because we're Southerners, and we tie celebrating with food, right? But in all actuality, even though this is a day that we're to afflict our souls, this is absolutely, without a doubt, a day that we are to celebrate. This is not a doom and gloom day. It is a day of celebration. Now, I realize that afflicting our soul isn't something people are generally excited about doing until you think about the alternative, right? Think about the alternative and what all this day represents, and then you realize that our part is relatively small. Very small, isn't it? It would much, uh, you know, I would much rather afflict my soul, as I'm doing right now or attempting to do in a fast, than to have to afflict my soul as Christ did when he was crucified. Right? If you think about it, in that game idea or, or scheme of things, we, this is, this is um, a much easier afflicting of our souls than what Christ had to experience. So there is much to celebrate and be thankful for regarding this day, and it's not just going to be the meal after services. It's going to be something much greater, something much greater that's, that's uh, accomplished on this day, something much greater that this day uh, represents. Now, one thing for us to uh, take notice is in verse 32, the scripture goes as far uh, to tell us as, as long as the fasting takes and when it begins and when it ends, right? So we kind of, God made sure there was no loopholes there, right? There are those that fast, like I said, from midnight till noon and various other patterns. And if they, uh, you know, and if they aren't followed, it can lead to death, you know, as we're told here, the individual that doesn't afflict their soul, okay? So this is a very important day in God's plan. Now, you know, thinking back and looking back for Scripture, there was a lot of things that took place on this day. And it was very important for the details to be followed. Now, we know that when Moses was going before Pharaoh, who was with him? Aaron. Right? Moses and Aaron. And then we know that after they left Egypt, Aaron's family began what we refer to as the Levitical priesthood. Right? So Aaron had a family. And his boys were part of that priesthood. And there's a time when they decided to take things upon themselves and make some changes. 
and they burnt uh, what was referred to in the scripture as strange or different incense than what they were supposed to do, and they did this in the Holy of Holies, which in the presence of the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, you know, I have a replica of the Ark of the Covenant at my house. I brought it to church before, and the Ark of the Covenant is the Ten Commandments. It was a bowl of manna, and then there was the uh, rod of uh, Jesse that continually uh, blooms. Now, if you watch Raiders of the Lost Ark, and you see when they opened the Ark of the Covenant, there was nothing but sand in there, right? Now, this is a movie. But the power that was emulated in that movie when those spirit beings come out, and, of course, all the Nazis are, you know, consumed... And what does uh, Indiana Jones say to, to uh, Miriam right beside him? He says, close your eyes, don't look. And they're the only ones left standing. And the Ark of the Covenant was in the Holy of Holies. And it was only to be visited once a year. And not just anyone could walk in there. The priest would walk in there. And if you read through various, uh, uh, various like history texts, they say that they would wrap a rope around the priest's foot. So that by some chance if he went in there and did things not correctly and God struck him dead, they could pull him out without going in. Right? Now imagine being a high priest and knowing that it's your turn or that you've been selected that you're going into the Holy of Holies this year. I would imagine it would be very nerve-wracking. You would want to make sure you're doing everything exactly and precisely as you should. And, you know, let's go to Leviticus chapter 16, just a few pages over. And, you know, what this also tells us is that God struck both of Aaron's boys dead. And this tells us what? That God is not a respecter of persons. This was Aaron who was with Moses. These were his boys, his children. And let's, let's begin reading in Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 1. We're going to read a few scriptures here. And the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they offered before the Lord... And they died. And the Lord said to Moses, Speak to Aaron your brother, that he does not come in at all times into the sanctuary within the veil before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, so that he does not die. So God the Father, or as we know, excuse me, Jesus Christ, who was the God of the Old Testament, is instructing Moses, Tell Aaron... You don't just walk in here any old, you know, good time. And that he even went as far to say, if Aaron comes in here, he'll die too. And we can think of Moses and Aaron, very, very visible figures in the uh, congregation of Israel. For I will appear in a cloud over the mercy seat, and this is over the Ark of the Covenant. And Aaron shall come into the sanctuary this way with a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. And he shall put on the holy linen coat, and he shall have the linen uh, breeches on his flesh. And he shall be girded with a linen girdle, and with the linen uh, miter he shall be dressed. And these are the holy garments. He shall wash his flesh in water and put them on. So as you understand, the priest that was going to go in once a year had to put these special garments on him. Before he did so, he had to bathe himself. All right? And we pick up in verse 5. And he shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer his young bull of a sin offer, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. And you have to understand this. Aaron, who is the priest that was going to, to, to go in, let's say, he had to make a sin offering just for himself, just for his role as the high priest, right? Right? But then we have the two goats that we know from the, uh, the goats that are so known about for the Day of Atonement. And in verse 7 it says, And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots on the two goats. And I know today we don't really under, understand. I had to look it up the first time I heard it. What's well, casting lots? You know, And casting lots is comparable to us is almost like flipping a coin or when people would take uh, sticks and have different levels and you would pull your stick out to, to see who had the longest stick or the shortest stick on who was going to go. 
Well, they would cast lots to see these two goats, which one was going to play which role. Okay? And Aaron shall cast lots on the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azel. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement upon it and send it away into the wilderness. Now this is where the term scapegoat comes from that we hear so many times today. People say, oh, he's a scapegoat, right? Well, the goat for Azel was, a scape, was the scapegoat. And this goat was not going to be killed. But the other one was going to be a sacrifice. And so Moses is informing Aaron of his role of this day and the importance of washing himself and putting these holy garments on. And now we know this because Aaron was actually performing what role? Aaron was performing the role of Christ, our high priest, when he put those holy garments on. And the difference between, you know, Aaron and Christ, miles and miles, right? But that's why that sacrifice had to be done for Aaron because Aaron was not perfect. He had sin, of course, because he was a human being. But he was walking in the footsteps of Christ when he was performing this role. Aaron probably wasn't fully aware of what steps he was walking in. You know, we've heard the term walking in the steps of giants. Aaron was actually doing that. He was walking steps uh, in the steps of Jesus Christ. Now, last night, you know, we br briefly talked about this just in a general discussion and how when Christ was crucified and Mary went to the cemetery to, to check on him and noticed the tomb was empty. And then Christ began speaking to her and she realized it was Christ. And what did he say to her? Touch me not, for I have not ascended to the Father. And, you know, Christ was fully aware of where he was about to go. And more importantly, what his role was going to be as our high priest. And you imagine Aaron bathing himself, putting on those holy garments. He wouldn't then walk over or walk outside and hug his family or something like that. No, he was cleaned in a roll. And when Christ was seen by Mary and Mary wanted to hug him, no, 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 don't, don't touch me. He was already in that role and uh, uh, planning to ascend to uh, God the Father. Now, we know later on they were allowed to touch him. But, but not at that particular place or time. Let's go over to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, there's a lot of, you know, symbolism in this day. And for many, many years, when the children of Israel took part in this day, they saw that symbolism. They saw the sacrifice. They saw the two goats being presented. And we can, we can look at these things very similar to to a lot of times people will tell you when, when Christ, before he was uh, crucified, what did they do? They brought him and Barabbas before the crowd. And, you know, they do that for translations, but when you look at Barabbas's name, what was it? It was identical to Christ's name. Look that up. Study it. So, in essence, there were two people stood before the crowd whose both of their names were uh, Jesus. And what did the crowd say? They wanted Barabbas released, and they wanted Christ crucified. And there's, a, there's some imagery there of those two goats that are being presented, right? And obviously we know Christ went on to be the ultimate sacrifice. And beginning in Hebrews chapter 9, uh, beginning in verse 1, it says, Truly then the first tabernacle also had ordinances of worship and an earthly sanctuary. We don't, we don't have that any longer, do we? Yeah, we come here to services, right? Uh, we're renting this part of this building. For many years, when I was growing up, I had uh, people that would make fun of me because uh, not only was my religion or my beliefs a little different, but for a long time, we met in a room at a cabinet shop. 
you know, the brewer, uh, brewer cabinets had an area, and we, we rented or, or attended in that room. I don't even know if they charged rent, but we, that's where we met. And so people would say, so you, you go to church on Saturday and y'all meet in a cabinet shop? You know, and people, people do that, right? Because we are programmed, as you drove to church today, you probably saw a lot of big church buildings, right? And even the Jewish people who keep the Sabbath as well, they have huge synagogues, right? But, you know, we don't have that temple where all these things took place anymore, right? Now, we know that we're the temple, but you know what I'm speaking of. And so we see here, the first tabernacle also had an ordinance of worship, an earthly sanctuary, right? For the first tabernacle, which is called holy, was furnished, in which were uh, placed both the lampstand and the table and the loaves of showbread. So when you had the, the original temple... There was the area where you walked in, and there was the lampstand. There was the showbread. And the priests could go into there daily, and they did, right? But then within the sanctuary, there was a veil, and that area was off limits except one time a year, and that's today. And even in that one time of year, all the priests didn't march in there. No, one one did. And, as, and you start seeing when you, when you read these things and, and you learn about them, then you kind of understand why, why is that verse in there that shortly after Christ takes his last breath, what does it say? The veil was ripped from top to bottom in the synagogue. You say, why is that in there? It was because there was some imagery taking place, right? In verse 3, but behind the second veil was the tabernacle, which is called the Holy of Holies, containing a golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant, which was overlaid on all sides with gold, and which was the golden jar containing the manna. Talked about that. It was in the Ark. And the rod of Aaron that had sprouted, and the tablets of the Old Covenant, or excuse me, the, the Covenant. I shouldn't say Old, of the Covenant. What we refer to as the Ten Commandments that Moses came down the hill from. And arching above it were uh, cherubims of glory, spreading their wings over the mercy seat. Now, it's interesting. It's referred to as the mercy seat, but there is not a seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant. There are the two angels, and that middle area is what is referred to as the mercy seat, but th there's not a seat there, but that is where God would appear, right? But it's a covering. It is the, what we're talking about is the lid the covering of the Ark of the Covenant, the lid, the top. But it's better to use the word covering. Concerning which now is a time to expound in detail in verse 6. Now with these things uh, prepared in this manner, the priests enter into the first tabernacle at all customary times in order to perform their services. Like I said, they go and go, right? But the high priests enter above into the second tabernacle once a year, not without blood, not without blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins that the people committed in ignorance, in ignorance. Now, we've got sins, but we've also got sins of ignorance. And you think about the sins of ignorance, things that we're not even aware that we're doing daily that are wrong, right? And in verse 8, the Holy Spirit signifying this, um, that the way of the holiest has not been made manifest while the first tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are being offered that are not able to perfect the one performing the service. It's pertaining to the conscience. So, you know, we don't have the temple to look at anymore, but the first church did. The early church did, you know. When the apostles were, were telling people about Christ and the Messiah, the temple was still standing for many more years. And these things were taking place, and they were watching them. But guess what? It was a shadow of things to come, and that's what Christ was. He was that priest, that high priest. And in verse 10, these services consist only of meat and drink offerings and various washings and physical ordinances imposed until the time of the new spiritual order. But Christ himself has become our high priest of the coming good things through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, 
What's that? The greater and more perfect tabernacle. Is that not us? It's a spiritual tabernacle. Are we not the tabernacle of God? Right? And you think of that word tabernacle, and so many people read over it. And it says, right, talking about when Christ, right, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was made flesh, right? And what does it say? And the Word tabernacled among us. There's a lot of significance in that when we go into the Feast of Tabernacles. In the Bible it says that that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. But that word, the correct translation, is tabernacled among us, right? And made uh, by human hands, this is not of the present physical creation. Not by the blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood. We're talking about Christ's blood. He entered once for all into the holiest, having by himself secured everlasting redemption for us. Now we understand why he looked at Mary and said, do not touch me. Right? For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of heifers sprinkled on those who are defiled uh, sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, to a far greater degree the blood of Christ. Now we're, now we're talking about real, real blood. Who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God shall purify your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. We know so little, but here's the catch. We don't need to discount what we do know. We don't know a lot. There's a lot we don't know, but we don't need to discount what we do know. This day is a day that we afflict our souls, but it's actually the day that our souls are going to ultimately be released from affliction. Think about that. We're afflicting our souls today, but this day actually represents a day that our souls are going to be released from affliction. We sin, and our sins are forgiven, but they aren't always forgotten, right? Paul struggled with that, didn't he? You know, he was there taking part in the stoning of the early Christians, and yet then he changed, but that haunted him, if that's a, if that's an appropriate word. We commit sins. We're forgiven for our sins, but some of those sins still haunt us, don't they? They still follow us around. You know, But if we understand correctly, one day, this day, our sins are going to be placed on the back of Satan, right? As well as just like that goat is taken into the wilderness, our sins and our memories of those sins are going to be removed. Taken further than the eye can see, right? Christ's blood being so much greater than the blood of an animal sacrifice covers our sins and the sins of the world. And in verse uh, 12, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, he entered once for all into the holy, holiest, having by himself secured everlasting redemption for us. He entered once into the holy place and obtained eternal redemption for us all. Now let's drop down to verse 24 and read a few more here. Same book, Hebrews chapter 9, just drop down to verse 24. For Christ has not entered into the holy place made by human hands, which are mere copies of the true. Rather, he has entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God. And you might want to say these are two very powerful words. What's the next two? For us. If it was just so he could go before God, no. That for us. For us. Not that he should offer himself many times even as a high, price, a high priest enters into the Holy of Holies year by year with the blood of others. So this is something they had seen, just like we keep the Day of Atonement every year. Repeat, repeat. This is not my first time to fast. It's not your ter- first time to fast. It may be someone in this room's first time to fast, and, or someone online it might be the first time for you to fast. And, and you're doing a great thing if that's um, of what you're doing and, and wish you the best. But... Christ entered once into the Holy of Holies, it says here. For then it would have been um, 
necessary for him to suffer many times since the foundations of the world, but now once and for all and the cons uh, cons consummation of the ages, he has been manifested for the purpose of removing sin through his sacrifice of himself. And in verse 27, and in so much as, as it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear the second time without sin unto salvation to those who are eagerly awaiting him. Today is Yom Kippur, right? The Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement, the Day of Reconciling. And that word Kippur means what? It means to cover. It means to conceal. And, you know, I was thinking about this. I asked McKinnon yesterday, what's a, what's a cover-up? What's a cover-up? And a lot of times we have a negative look at the cover-up, right? We say, you know, that's when somebody's done something bad and certain people make certain things look this way to cover up an illegal activity that's taking place, right? Yeah, that's, a, that's what we refer to a cover-up. But sometimes a cover-up can be good. You think about that. Sometimes a cover-up can be good, you know? And so we look at what's being done for us. This covering, this concealing is a good thing. It is where Jesus Christ came and walked in the footsteps of man, lived a perfect life, overcome the temptations of Satan, died, was the ultimate sacrifice, right? And why? To cover our sins. That you could hit rewind or go back, or whatever it is you have on your remote, all the way back to the beginning in the Garden of Eden, where Eve was about to grab that piece of fruit, it didn't happen. Putting things back right, the way they were supposed to be. And I want you to think about this, what we just read. The blood was sprinkled on the covering of the ark, on the eastward side and before the mercy seat seven times. And you can also read where that blood would have went out, the, the priest would have went outside and he would have thrown blood on the actual people in the crowd standing outside the temple. So you imagine standing there and having the blood splatting on your face. It was to hammer home a point of what? Sin equals death. Sin equals death. Blood is death. Right? And so I want you to think about this. When they go into the Holy of Holies, it says the blood was sprinkled on the covering of the ark. Okay, that's the lid. It doesn't just say they poured it all over the ark. No, it doesn't say that. It says it was put on the eastern, eastward side of the ark. And before the mercy seat, that's right in the middle. What is the eastward side of the ark? It's the same as the right side. Our high priest, our savior, sits on the right hand of God. He sits on the right hand of God awaiting his time to return. And it's uh, by his blood that our sins, once and forever, are going to be covered. You think about that. His blood is sitting right before his feet and right in the center where God the Father sits. On the ark, when they were, were doing that, when they were going through those processes of teaching, those schoolmasters. So, you know, think about that. Today is a day to be celebrated. Yeah, it's a day that we don't get to eat. But it is a day of great things. It is a day of greatness in God's plan. And we don't understand every aspect of it. You know, one aspect that obviously we do understand about it is that we are to afflict our souls and that we're to do it from sunset to sunset. And it is a day to celebrate. And it is a day of blood. And it is a day of salvation. 
and it is a day of accomplishment for Jesus Christ and God the Father, and everything that, that, that they have in, in vision for the future was put back on track. And we're just now awaiting the return of Christ.